2015, if you think about the world population and world religion, again, it's an estimate. It's an estimate that the world population is about 7.2 billion people. It's estimated that the Christian believes it's about two and a half billion. It's estimated 2015 that the Muslim believe is 1.74. So again, you have already two religions that cross over half of the world population based on Judaism. And if you take the entire, about nine main religion, we're not speaking about cult or sect, by religion, most of the world religion, which is again, if you wrap it up, even with Sikhism, Buddhism, Shintoism, Confucianism, you end up by the core belief of about, about, again, we excluding um, those who call themselves Gnostic or Atheists, just those who have some type of religion, most of those religions, maybe excluding part of the Shintoism, they believe in the concept of afterlife, of world to come. Different formulation, but the idea is, it's a belief, and again, we can say 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the world population believe that there is something after the person is no longer among the living, there is a heavenly tribunal, there is a judgment, there is a account of a person, a very short, uh, transient, brief life in this world. What exactly happened, for sure there are different views uh, between the Catholicism, the purgatory and others, but the key is there is a concept that most of the world population hold that when a person's goal, which we call in our simple anthropomorphic language, there, the soul needs to give an account in a sense, they review the person's life and, um, and uh, he or she needs to explain certain patterns, certain behavior, certain matter that they did. That's the reason why in Judaism the rabbi says so much with the concept of teshuva that's based on the Torah. The idea of teshuva, by the way, you see it in Islam a lot. It's called tuba, which the concept is the same concept. You see it in Islam, in the literature of Al-Ghazali um, of the 9th century in Spain. You see it in the literature of Abu Arabi. You see it in a few Sufis um, believe that tuba, or by us, is teshuva based on the book of Deuteronomy, that um, there is a concept of returning. A person, as the Rambam tells us, the great Maimonides of the 12th century, he said to us that uh, the person needs to first regret, express it in words, um, express a great remorse and contrition, and the third stage is commit himself or herself to, to not to repeat it and to be a better person. So it's a story told about one of the great rabbis that um, was the absolute um, epitome of, of piety. And the story told that um, he went before heavenly tribunal. And after he passed um, all the procedure, they, they pointed out something that um, <coughs> caused him, in a sense, um, a great sorrow. It turns that um, many times when you have the certain expressions <coughs> of name of God, it was in vain or it wasn't with the proper kavanah, proper intent. Um, this is something that in some prayer book <coughs> you see at the very opening of our prayer book from the late a rabbi of Buchach, it was a Hasidic rabbi, that he invented something beautiful. He said that the person should make a declaration before you're praying 
that all the time that I'm going to pronounce the name of God, <coughs> I'm making a declaration that I intend so and so and so. So it will not appear that I'm expressing the name of God in any form of vanity. Because unfortunately, it happens sometimes that we pray and we're in a rush for all kind of reason. I know Gilbert never like it, but you have people that does that sometimes, right? So when it happens, we have to be careful because when we say the name of God, it has <coughs> to have a certain, there are still certain Sidurim that they have the Yud Kei Vav Kei, the explanation of each and every words. So here we are with the idea of thought, the connection between Machshava, the thought, and Dibur, an act of expressions. So the Code of Jewish Law, on chapter 258, section 13, <coughs> elaborates on the idea, for example, of daka, of giving charity. You're thinking about giving charity to some, and you did not express it in word, but you make up your mind that you're going to give something to someone. It's a debate in the code if this is already a commitment or not. Again, you didn't say it, but you not only considered, you committed yourself in your thought. Look, this is a huge beauty in Judaism. We're not counting only expression in the mouth. The thought, take Passover, when you said, I annul any chametz, even your mind, <coughs> biblically speaking, it's over. You're not, you are ownerless of chametz. So here we are with a very interesting dynamic, very interesting talk here. First, it's in regard to tzedakah. What happened, we learn in the previous dapim that when someone make a neder, neder is a form of serious vow. So even the mikzat, even if it's a partially, partially statement of vow, it's already, you take it as a vow. If you remember, you see that someone holding a cup with a, a handler, right? You see the handler and you see the cup, right? Okay, can you give it to me for a second? Okay, for those who just came today. So you have the cup and you have the handler, right? This is called in Hebrew Yad, and this is the cup. I can drink directly from the cup. But by holding the handler, since it's connected to the cup, so when I drink, it's basically the same as I hold the cup. The idea, thank you, the idea is, when it's come to yadot nedarim, you do a partially part of form of vow, it's considering as a nedar. So, for example, if you make up your mind that this money is going to tzedakah, to charity, so, and you said to yourself, okay, this is a hundred dollars that's going to charity. But then somebody, uh, you have an urgent need to, to, to pay someone something. Can you use that money? In other words, you planning to take this hundred dollars and this evening to give it to a poor person. But you're planning to give it regardless, right? But you have here the hundred dollars that you already contributed to someone, it's just not around. Can you meanwhile use this 100 to pay your um, cleaning person or to, to pay something that just come up in between and you need cash? The question is, it's, you have Yad lit tzedakah, you have a handle when it's come to tzedakah or not. We have a school of thought. We try to compare it to the idea of the sacrificial offering. In the Torah, we say that, well, when it's come to sacrificial offering, if you make a partially commitment, it's already considering as a full commitment. Can you say that this apply in the same manner? The rabbi is rejecting that. You know why? They said when it's come to offering, if you remember the several days we explained, that there is a concept called bal te'acher. You should not be delay, you should not be late. It's a different concept, which is if you commit yourself, for example, on Pesach or on Shavuot, to give certain offering, 
So you have a time frame up to the end of the year, which is the following Pesach. That's the way you count the offering in a temple. But in Tzedakah, as we said, in a very serious school of thought, we're going even by your reflection, by your thought itself. So here, the question is, when it's come to Tzedakah, most of the rabbis hold that even you not express it in words, you just think about it, it's already a contribution. Uh, it's all already um, happened. Versus if you said this coin or this money is going to Tzedakah. There is a book, for example, called Beit Shlomo. It's an excellent book that have a response over that. S and he dealt with the idea of Chalot Tzedakah. Um, a good exam another example is Rabbi Akiva Eger. The rabbi we mentioned many times, you see his picture in my home. Everyone asks, who is this rabbi so walking? It's him and his son-in-law. Famous painting. Now you see it in my son's home. He likes this picture so much, it's over there already. Anyway, you saw one of these pictures in the dining room. Anyway, Rabbi Akiva Eger, the story goes that um, he was up on the bima, and the Gabbai asked him about donation. You know, in, especially in European, it's very common to give someone honor. So it's not just an honor, he needs to give something to whatever, the synagogue, the cause, the Talmud Torah, the yeshiva, something. So the Gabbai said something, and he didn't specify it. And Rabbi Kiva Igor already nod his head. So then he comes down, and he said, he wrote a response and everything, that it's already, even he nod his head, it's over. He needs to pay. So um, here, we start with several quandaries, several questions. Question number one is the idea if there is a partial commitment, partial um, um, intim intimation, meaning partial of expression when it's come to the charity or not. So we are attracted in the rim, page seven, two lines from the top of the page. Yes, Yadlitz Daka or En Yadlitz Daka. If someone wanted to consecrate it, to dedicate it, something to tzedakah, to charity. So Rav Papa asked, if you said a partial declaration, didn't express yourself clearly, is that already an effective one? Hey Chedami, let's deal with this predicament. If you said these dollars for tzedakah and that dollar, so it's it's not yad, it's not partial. Ela kegonde amar hadein velo amar nami. You have two five dollars bills in two different locations, and you said these five dollars are going to tzedakah, and you didn't say anything about the second one. So you said my. Haden namets daka, kama odilma vehaden so lenafkuta bealma kama or vedibua udelo aske. If you said this five dollars for tzedaka and this, and you didn't say and this one is also for tzedaka, you meant to say that the moment you say the word in this, it's already incorporated both of them, both bills, or you said since you didn't express it lucidly that the second one is go for tzedakah, therefore it only applies to the first one. Tosfot and the run said, why you don't compare it to the law of shvu'ah, the law of making an oath? Because when someone used this manner, what did the Torah say? Kol neder vechol shvua. Any manner of neder of oath. So you can say the same manner, like in Hekesh, the same manner you have there, you should do here. So anyway, now um, the Gemara elaborates on that and said, Mi amrinan, can we said, kevan de itkash le korbanot, since we compare 
to the sacrificial offering in the Torah. Dichtiv, because it's written in the book of Dvarim, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 24. Beficha, it's coming out of, it comes from your mouth. You said it clearly in your mouth. And therefore, we learn in Tractate Rosh Hashanah, page 6, Zot Zdaka. So the moment that, like Isaiah said in 45, Yatsami Pitz Daka, it's come out of your mouth, that's it. That's a commitment. Makur Banot Yeshlaim Yad, Avts Daka Yeshlaim Yad, the same way sacrificial offering, they have a handler, meaning you said a part and it's already offering. The same applied to Tzedaka, or Dilma, or you may said, Levalte Acherudi Itkash. You can compare it to the notion of you shall not delay. You can say both, which is offering and Tzedaka, but not here. So as we mentioned earlier, the code in Yoredea, in um, 2.58, the Rema elaborates and have a big to do over thinking, over thought in Tzedaka. Even you thinking about something, that's sufficient. In short, there are two avenues, Shtei Shitot, two different ways. One, they said Bepicha, meaning only when it's come to your mouth, from your mouth, not in your thought. That's one school of thought. But there is another one that said, no, the moment, the idea of all you thought, uh, you know, we talk about Baal Teacher, etc. But here, the moment you um, um, uh, express it, express. That's, by the way, the reason. Soon you see uh, several poskim dealing with that, Ktsot Achosh and others. The idea that the moment um, someone, for example, get Aliyah, he should say Bli Neder, without making a vow. Because all this definition of Nedarim, it's very um, serious. The Chalot Nedarim, it's uh, something that the Rabbi said that even you said the partial expressions, even it's come, it's already commitment. Now, the, since we talk about uh, different um, quandaries, we have another one from Rav Papa. Yesh Yad Lehefkir, or En Yad Lehefkir. Is there a real effectiveness when it's a, a intimation, which means when you have a partial declaration of something that is worthless or not. Example, you remember before Passover, you said, I don't own any chametz, but if there's any chametz in my domain, it's all ownerless. Or in Israel now, this is Shemitah, this is sabbatical year. You own a property, that uh, contain, for example, lemon trees, right? You said, it's ownerless. I'm not owning it. So therefore, if you said it in part, you didn't say a full declaration, is that something that considering as effective or not? So the Gemara said, what's the question? <laughs> we already discussed it earlier. Why? Hainutz Daka, that's what Rav Papa said earlier. So Tosfot explained that by comparing the two, why a person, for example, you own a, a property in Israel and you give it away, or you give part away. Why you do that? You want the poor people to use it, right? Like for example in Pe'a, remember we discussed it? You leave a corner to, for the poor. So. It is some sort of um, comparison or similarity between the two. You can match them and say that it's one. Im timtzalomar kamar, im timtzalomar, yeshad litzdaka, the ene kesh lemechza. Which means, even you don't have in that line the Torah a very clear statement. But you may say that when it's come to this um, juxtaposition, it can be in part, which is um, if someone have a yad, a partially, not full. So 
it's when it's come to tzedakah, we said yes, it's an effect. So you can say the same thing when it's come to honorless. Mi amrinan hainu tzedakah, you say that it's the same as matter of law of charity, as we explained several times today, that charity, even in part, it's already commitment. O dilma shane tzedaka, di tzedaka lo chazya ela laniyim, aval efker ben laniyim ben lashirim. Tzedaka, when you give that charity, it's intent to whom? To poor people. Versus when it's come to honorless, when it's honorless declaration applies to what? Regardless if they are poor or rich. So the Rambam in Ilchot Nedarim chapter 2 wrote that the honorless is the same as the manner of a vow that the person cannot change his mind. Cannot change his mind meaning that you said it, it's over. Now, the Ktsoda Hoshan asks, is that mean that you are no longer owns it or not? Um, <coughs> trace the situation. You have in your um, spot, you have a car on the street that you own. You call an organization and you say to them, pick up the car, it's yours. I donate this car. Hmm. He said, we are coming to pick it up. They didn't show up for two days. Meanwhile, you get a ticket. Who needs to pay the ticket? If you tell me that you are no longer on it, you gave it to the organization, they didn't show up that day. No, what do you think? So here you see the Ketzotah Hoshan said that based on this Rambam, um, it's, it's not so simple, right? You may say that um, it's, it's no longer yours. It's no longer yours. So you not hold it. I'll give you another example. There is a famous story about Khatam Sofer. Listen to this. Khatam Sofer was one of the giant of the giant rabbis in Hungary, head of the Jewish community, head of the rabbinic court. In those days in Europe, I wish to do it in America. Someone standing um, up every Shabbat or every holiday and announce, give, have a chart, a list of expenses. We have electricity, we have um, um, yeshiva, we have Talmud Torah, we have a building fund, we have, we have, we have. We need for this one, used money, American money, right? This one 5,000, this one 10,000, this one 20,000, gives a list. All right, I'm selling the first opening of the Torah. Who is going to commit himself, etc., etc.? I'm going to sell now the third aliyah, the fourth aliyah. And this way, they cover the expenses. I think, Gilbert, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Syrian in Coney Island, Brooklyn, is still doing that. I've, I'm almost positive. Anyway, it, uh, there are some communities that do that. You know, the people who are not so familiar, I heard from seculars that come, they get like, what's going on here? It's not an auction, you know? But they don't understand that the religious institution also need to survive in a certain way. When you have the assembly of people, it's an opportunity to do it. Anyway, so the fellow came and asked him a question. He said, I commit myself, let's use American money, $1,000. But guess what? Whereby I do not remember which one of these least I committed myself. No, what do you think? So if you start with the run, Rabbeinu Nisim tells us here that we have to differentiate between Biblical and Rabbinic. Safek de Oraita, if it's a Biblical question, Biblical quandary, you go stringent. If it's Rabbinic, you go lenient. Now, how you treat it? You treat it as a Safek Mamon, if it's a something related to money, or you said it, it's not. So there is a book called Machne Ephraim. He tried to say, look, here it's um, kind of, maybe you said that it's Safek Mamon, it's question over money, it's not question of a quandary over um, um, uh, oath or vow because he agreed to pay the thousand. He just don't remember which one. 
So he tried to say he was an example within the example. It was a gabait dakai, it was a charity fund that someone was in charge. Imagine a guy goes around collecting money. He has in his one pocket on the right side pile of money. Okay? On his left side, he have also money, but that's his personal money. Guess what happened? It was some ice cream on the floor. He stumbled and the money was scattered all over. And it's mixed between the two pockets. He doesn't know which one is his and which one is tzedakah. What do you do now? So if you come up to tzedakah, it's the same as pe'a, as we discussed earlier. That's biblical. You have to go stringent. If um, it's healthcare, if it's ownerless, it's rabbinic, so you go lenient. So the Khatam Sofer tells us, he tells that fellow, that when it's come to this, unfortunately, you commit yourself to 1,000. You don't know each one of these five. Guess what you have to do? You have to give 5,000. You have to give 1,000 to each of them, since you don't remember which one. Dovi, did you hear that? Yes, I did. Anyway, that's the famous Khatam Sofer. Okay, so here we know that certain sacred texts, like reading the Shema, like the Word of Torah, we have to treat them with the highest respect. So when you are in the bathroom, it's incongruous, right? Very inappropriate for a person to um, to say, to make a prayer, to say anything that relates to the sacred. It's like profane, right? So Ravina said, if a person did not did it in full, if he did it in part, the Torah tells us in Deuteronomy 23, verse 15, you can, shall be holy, which means that you cannot say anything. So here the question, if you do it in part, right? Is still a problematic or not? Hey, Chedame, let's understand. If a person dedicated, he is now building his home, and he said, guess what? This room is going to be a laboratory, right? So he's already, He has a big house, so he said, this location is going to be a bathroom. And this, he doesn't say this one is going to be bathroom. This, he said. So this can be either dining room or living room or kitchen or bathroom. Right? You don't, he doesn't say in full. So therefore, that it's in part. Right, right part. It's like handler. It's part. It's not the full. So he said, Beit HaKisen Name Ava. So if he said Beit HaKiseh, that's a fool, right? Ela kigon de amar vehaden, velo amar namei, mai aden, de amar vehaden namei, Beit HaKiseh, dil mamai, o dil mamai, vehaden et ashmisha ba'al makama. So the question is, what does that mean when he said, and this? You said, this one is going to be a um, laboratory, and this. And this meaning what? Either you said his bathroom, or he meant to say for something else. Michlal, so therefore, di pshita le le ravina, di esh zimun le beita kise. And even you are not in real, in active, use it as a bathroom, just by saying in part it's already effective. Babi, by le le ravina, we learn in both Intracted Brachot, page 26, and Intracted Shabbat, page 10, he zmino le beita kise mau, he zmino le beita merchatz mau. Zimun mo'il or zimun lo mo'il. If a, a person is designated certain part for bathroom, certain part for the bathhouse, but it's not a final stage, so you tell me that this designation is effective or not. So the Gemara said, Ravina chad amigo chad kamibayalei. Zimun mo'il o'en zimun mo'il, b'im t'imtze l'omar yesh zimun o'en yad t'ibay alei. So the Gemara left that it's in a choir, it's a question. It's not simple because he said it in part. 
and since it's settled in part, it's already in part a framework of something that he should avoid to involve. So for example, since the, the bathhouse is it's a place that you cannot express a sacred um, text, so it's already totally circumscribed the text, limited, not to, to use any sacred part or not. The Ran, Rabbeinu Nisim, tried to say that this is feika de Rabbanan lekula, that this is a debate over a rabbinic view, we should go lenient. But the late Rav Vosner, Rav Vosner was a great rabbi in Bnei Brak. He gave me a beautiful letter in 1986 or 7. I wrote one of my books, so he saw the manuscript, he wrote me a very beautiful personal approbation. But anyway, so he asked a question about a religious institution, Mossad, that they're planning to build a building that they have five floors. So far, they built it only two floors. It's the middle of the building. But Kenaina Hore, Baruch Hashem, many people need to use this building. So in their plan, it's already the bottom floor, it's mikveh, the first floor, it's the Beta Midra, Sheshiva, etc. Now, they just build a structure, you know, the middle of the building. And so far, with the money issue and everything, they build only this uh, basement or bottom floor and the first floor. Since it's already stated that the bottom floor is a mikveh, even it's not yet effective, can we daven there? Can we put the Sefer Torah? And it's not nothing there yet. They just build, they dig in mm. underground, for example, and they build in all the structure of the first and the second floor. But there's nothing there. You don't have the pipe system. You don't have. It's it's just a structure that we build. So I ask him a question. Since based on this Gemara, since it's already declaration that this part is going to be mikveh, and as we just learn that you don't do in those bathhouses anything related to Torah. So, can we pray there? Can we study there? So Rav Ojna said, when it's all said and done, you can do it right. at this stage. But the fact that he have all this malach, all these long discussions, it's based on this Gemara, that um, the moment you even partially um, um, designate a certain area to be a laboratory, to be a bathhouse, it's already under that domain anyway. The Mishnah said, next case is, if someone said, menude ani lecha, menude ali lecha, which means the person said, we are distanced from each other. So Rabbi Akiva, the Mishnah said, haya chochech baze leachmir. Rabbi Akiva have this time of um, thinking, of um, debate, uh, big struggling, we should go stringent. It's not clear if he meant to say stringent or not, but anyway. Amar Abayei, Moder Rabbi Akiva Linyan Malkot, Shein Oloke, even he thinking stringent, but since the person just said, Menudea Nilecha, right? It's already, um, um, in part, but not as far as getting malkot, lashes. So he said, the imken nitnei Rabbi Akiva machmir. That if it means that it's stringent, we should say that Rabbi Akiva go in stringency. There's a famous teshuva of the Noida Biuda. Noida Biuda is Rabbi Landau. It's an absolute um, great luminary rabbi who served the Jewish community in Prague in, in old days Czechoslovakia. So we learn, if you remember in the past, the Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom, that was a great rabbi by name of Rabbeinu Gershom, that he, in the early time of 11th century, he put um, a lot of boundaries for the Jewish community. For example, for the Ashkenazi community, that the person should not marry more than one wife. For example, if you write a letter and you said, Cherem de Rabbeinu Gershom, so it's already prohibited to anybody else that you're not allowed to read that letter. 
um, there is a lot of, of rules that he pull, put. Uh, to this very day, it's a big debate. If it's only for Ashkenazim, everyone agreed. But if it's only for his community at that time, it's only for 100 years, it's for 300 years, it's still applicable, it's not applicable, it's not clear <coughs> if the Cherem de Ben Gershom has an application. But anyway, here is the debate if Cherem de Ben Gershom, when, uh, if that's a biblical or a meaning. Cherem, in general, it's like putting something under the ban. Here is an example. Jews are persecuted in almost everywhere in Europe. It was a well-known story that the Jews in Spain were persecuted in such a way that they either are forced to convert to Christianity or they have to move out or sometimes get killed by the Holy Order of the Inquisition. So it was a well-known harem statement that Jews should not go back to Spain. In a sense, um, it's like this is the place that so much Jewish blood was split. So anyway, so they ask the Rav of Munkac, who was a great rabbi in, in uh, Eastern Europe. They ask him, can we go now? It's about 400 years afterward, 500 years, depending how you look. Look at our days. You have oil, for example, company that we use for Pesach. And that oil comes from Spain. So they need to say the, the um, religious organization, the rabbinic supervision organization, needs to send the Star K, for example, the OU and other organizations, they need to send the Mashgichim, the supervisor, to Spain to watch over in order to give them the Kashrut certificate. Can they go or not? So the Mulkach Rebbe tried to say that since it's not, nothing is written, it's just a, something that people have heard about, so he said it's not a issue. But in general, when it's come to um, Cherem, here is an um, example. Amar of Papa ben Nedina Minach, the Kula Alma Lopligi de Asur, Meshamtin al Minach, the Kula Alma Shari. So again, the big question is, if you said something that I'm prohibited to you, like we said, the community prohibited to go to Spain, I'm prohibited to you to do something, you're prohibited to me. So Tosfot said that it's klala, it's like a language of curses. It's like you're putting a, some type of, of um, boundaries or certain uh, limitation around you. So they said, be my pligi, what exactly they disputation, what they disagree. Seven B, be mnudean li lechad rabi akiva sarar lishna de niduya, ve rabanan savar lishna de mshamtina hu. We have to understand that there is a two different component here, two different school of thought. Rabbi Akiva said that it's a language of clear nether. For example, the one said, sha'ani ochel ochal lecha, prohibited to eat with you. And the sages said that this is the language of nidui, of like putting a ban. So it's like distance from someone. So um, there is a response of from Rav Ovadia Yosef, may he rest in peace. Um, the Torah said that we should not go back to Egypt. Correct? Several times. So it's a question. Is that applied to that generation? Is that for everlasting? Here's a response over that. In short, number one, we have to differentiate between <coughs> a temporary visitor and permanent resident. Number two, you have to ask, is that specific time, biblical time, or specific time, or any time? According to Avovadia, it's not at any time. But anyway, Upliga de Rav Chizda, so even it's written, to you question, we have to differentiate between written and, ver and general, yes, even it's written, we have to ask, is written as a rule forever or not. Upliga de Rav Chizda, the Ahu Gavra, here is a story, the Amar Meshamatna Benichsei de Chavrei de Ravir Meyabaraba. He said, I put 
a shamta, it's like a boundary for any estate of this fellow. Ata lekamei de Rav Chizda. So he said, I am prohibited to drive any benefit from that fellow's estate. Amar le let le dechash la de Rabbi Akiva. People are not concerned. Even Rabbi Akiva, the Shittam Kubetz, it said, even Rabbi Akiva has some type of language of nether. We don't follow that school of thought, and we go by the majority of sages who dis disagree with him. Kasavar be meshamat na plige. So he hold that um, the disputation between Rabbi Akiva and the sages, and he said, I am meshamatna, I am prohibited from you. And therefore, Rav Chizda said that you're not concerned of Rabbi Akiva. Now, Amar Rabbi Ila Amar Rav, Nidau Befanav, Ein Matirim Lo Ela Befanav. Nidau Shelo Befanav, Matirim Lo Ben Befanav, Ben Shelo Befanav. He said something important. He says, when it's come to this type of excommunication, if you do it, um, and in, in the presence of a person, then it's one story. So you have to have the person's present in order to abrogate that. Because there are those who said that it's much stringent. And if it wasn't in his present, which means you express it, the idea of excommunication, the ban, not of his present, so therefore when you need to abrogate it, of the excommunication, it's regardless if he's present or not. Amarav Hanin Amarav. Hashomea has karat Hashem Remember in our introduction, we speak about the expression of name of God in vain. So one who hears the mention of the name of God in vain from his fellow mouth. So the question is, Tzarich lenadoto. You have to excommunicate him because this is violation of Torah. The Torah said in several places. We all know the Ten Commandments, right? The, the, you should not pronounce the name of God in vain, but there are other sources. The Imloni Dao, but if for some reason you didn't do that, you didn't excommunicate the one who profane, who will say the name of God in profanity in vain, who at Smoye Hebeni Dui, the person himself, goes to the state of excommunication. So, and the rabbi said it doesn't mean that he himself, it's like the framework that he deserve, right? Because shekol makom shazkarat Hashem metsuya sham aniyut metsuya, which means that uh, the same way as blessing of the name of God, bringing uh, wealth, bringing honor, bringing blessings, it's also go the other way around. If they're using the name of God in vain, it brings poverty. There are few sources that prove it. For example, the Torah said in the book of Shmot, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 21, Bechol makom in any place, asher azkiret me, that I give you the permission, Rashi said, to pronounce my name, Avo elecha uberachticha, I come upon you and bless you. So that's a blessing. Versus Zechariah, Zachariah in chapter 5, verse 4 said that if a person uh, use the name of God in vain, it's like bringing poverty, it's like a vowing in vain. Shekol makom shazkarat Hashem metsuya sham aniyut metsuya vaniyut kemita. So indigency is the same, it's considered like a death. death. Why? That's a famous statement, Shneemar, they said in the book of Shmuel, chapter 4, they said that, that Moses had those people who are informer, the two people that hit each other, you remember? And Moses said to them, wicked, why you lift up your hands? And he informed the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh wants to kill Moses, etc. So then God appeared to Moses and said, Ki metu kol anashim, that all those people who seek to, to get rid of you, they are all gone. Yeah. So they said, what does that mean? They are still alive, but it turns that Hashem caused those people, these people that caused Moses to run away for his life from Pharaoh, who wants to kill him. 
So he said here, uh, God told him, don't worry about them. They are dead. What does that mean? Dead, they turn to be very poor. The moment they are very poor, they're no longer a big macher, a big to-do, so they cannot do harm to him. So in a sense, poverty is like death. Vetanya kol makom shenatnu chachamim enehem, o mita o oni. That's a very frightening statement. The uh, Rosh and others bring an example, but the idea is that in any place that the sages put the eye or over certain um, domain, in a sense of um, of unhappiness, um, it caused the person poverty. Amar Rabbi Abba, Hava Kamina Kamed Ravuna. He heard this lady that said the name of God in vain. Shamta. So he put her under the excommunication. And right away, he annulled that statement. You learn three things. One, If you hear your fellow, that you pronounce the name of God in vain, you should put him under excommunication. That if you do it at his presence, you have to have his presence to annul it. And number three, which means you don't have to wait a period of time between the two entities, between the excommunication and annulling it. So the Rambam explained to us in Ilchot Amut Torah, chapter 7, section 13. He said, that if that person make the shuva, change his way, boom. So you can do it in a minute later, change around and take it back. Um, anyway, Amarav Gidel, Amarav, Talmid Chacham Menadel Atzmo, Mafer Atzmo. He said, the Torah scholar may excommunicate himself, but even revoke this excommunication. So again, that's applied to a very high level of piety. They can do that. This is said pshita. That's obvious. You may say that a prisoner cannot release himself. They need someone to, to have him out of jail. So since he commit himself to something, he needs to have the Rosh explain someone else to, to annul it. Kamash Melan, so Rav come and teach us that he can do it for himself if he commit himself for himself by himself. Echedame. Give me an example. So they said, Kihad Marazutra Hasida Kimichai Barav Beirav Bar Beirav Shamta, when one of the students need to be under that punishment, Meshamet Nafshe Bereisha, Vadar Meshamesh Bar Beirav. So he did first for himself. And then he did it to that um, excommunicated the student um, of the yeshiva. When he comes home after he left, he will annul the excommunication for himself, and then he will annul for his yeshiva student. So why? Because when the Ran explained before he walked in his house, needs to make sure that his family member will not distance from him if he's in excommunication. And then the Tosfot and the Rosh said, since he's now Zakai, since he's now a free, so he can do it for someone else, so he did it for his student. So the one said that that manner of excommunication is not applied only to the people who are present, it's applied to everyone, including his family members. So there is a famous Bach, the, one of the commentary on the code, his name is Bach, Bayit Hadash. So the Bach Hadashot, Siman Membet, chapter 42, he deal with the situation of a fellow that was very obnoxious and rude. What happened? It was a chazan, that was a Torah reader. And he read the Torah and he finds something that's a problematic. So he said, we should roll this Torah and take another Torah. The Bach was the Rav, he came in and he checked, and he said, no, it's fine, you can continue with this Torah. 
So that uh, Hazan was very rude. And he said, you don't know Alachot, you don't know what you're talking about, right? I can, I can no longer use this Torah, I need another one. So the Bach said to him, you will be in a Nidu, you will be excommunicated. Fight, horrible. So he responded, he says, you should be in a Nidu. So basically, if you go by the code, they said if two people do that, even for fun, like they laugh and they do that, so the first one is ineffective, the second one is effective. But the Bach said it's here it's different. Why? Because we learn a concept, it's called Bizui Talmid Chacham. When you denigrate the value of a Torah scholar. So when you have a Torah scholar, you have to be extra careful. So when the Torah scholar, he said it to him to warn him, right? And basically, uh, since he's already under that boundaries, so therefore, whatever he said, it's ineffective. That's what he tried to say in chapter 42 of the famous Bach. Ah! Uh -huh.